appreciate Aime's uh, uh, prudence in bringing backups to this uh, talk tonight. And it's wonderful to see Cynthia. Uh, we watch her on TV, and my wife keeps reminding me that's the one that was in high school with Vicky, our school with Vicky. Uh, tonight, uh, I, I want to pay homage for just a second to the American Chemical Society. As you've heard, it's the largest professional society in the world. And uh, it, I don't know if you realize this, but the ACS has a remarkable edu education program in addition to the Project C that you've already heard about. And the reason I was intrigued by the invitation from Jaime to be here tonight is uh, I work very closely with chemists at the University of the Nations in Hawaii. I've been teaching there since 1992 every summer. And the university was co-founded by Howard Malmstaff, who was a very famous spectroscopist and chemist at the University of Illinois. And I, I was so intrigued by some of our common background that uh, I, I really got to know him well. He just passed away two years ago, but he was very prominent in the American Chemical Society. And two of my uh, other professors there are also chemists. Uh, one was the head of the chemistry faculty at Wheaton College for 20 years. So it's really good to be at a meeting of the American Chemical Society. I once taught an electronics course at one of your annual meetings with Howard Malmstead, so I have fond memories of the ACS. Now the uh, objective of tonight's talk is to try to persuade you that students, scientists, and their families will gain much by pursuing hobby, by pursuing science as a hobby as much as a vocation. And I know too many scientists that when they leave work, that's it. They're not into science anymore. And sometimes their families uh, don't gain the benefit of their, of their knowledge and learning because of that. So I'm going to encourage you who are adults who have families to pursue some science with your family in your spare time. And that can include uh, uh, actual science projects, simple observations. It can include vacations with a science-centered theme or whatever. But it will include anything that's a lot better than watching movies and wasting your time doing things like that. And then I'm going to uh, hopefully persuade you tonight that do-it-yourself science, like the kind I do, will teach you to avoid preconceived agendas and notions and outcomes and to be very skeptical of your findings as a scientist. And uh, I appreciate hearing uh, Cynthia's stories about what it's like working in an active TV newsroom. And sometimes science is like that. We tend to pick out things that we think will attract public interest and ignore some of the fundamentals and the basics. And I hope to persuade you tonight that it's crucial not to do that, but to be extremely concerned about the fundamentals of science, and that uh, this form of traditional science has long been advocated by the National Academies of Science and Engineering. Now, before, uh, oh, one other thing. You might even make a discovery, uh, as you'll see what my children have done over the years uh, doing their science through uh, their schooling. And then finally, families can have lots of fun doing science on vacation ways that you might never have imagined. Just go to Google and type in science vacation, words, keywords like that, you'll get a lot of good ideas. Now we're going to look at a PowerPoint that I'm going to get you organized here on how to show it. Ah, it works. But I don't begin any talk without giving the, the today's science news. The today's science news is Asian dust and Mexican smoke. And these plots here are by the Navy Research Lab and uh, Monterey, uh, California. And they're showing you the forecast of dust for today at 6 o'clock this evening. And this is the dust from Asia, that green, that's come all the way from China and the Gobi Desert, all the way across the Pacific Ocean. I just got back from Hawaii, and the dust it was just going north of the island. And so I had really good calibration conditions there. Usually when I'm here, the dust is there. This stuff includes lots of air pollution. It's got mercury in it. There's a special EPA experiment at uh, the Mauna Observatory where I live for 10 days every year. And they're collecting this dust, analyzing the mercury in it. And guess where the mercury's coming from? Power plants in China. And we're contributing to that. I call it the Walmart effect. We're exporting all of our manufacturing to China. And then they use their cheap coal-producing electricity to uh, build the products that we buy over here. And then we get some of the pollution in return. The, uh, down here, this is Central America, that's smoke. And ordinarily, just out here, the smoke is up into Texas, and it was a week or so ago. But it's been pushed back by some coal friends, and hopefully it'll stay down there. But there's your science news. Here's the sulfur dioxide, by the way. Uh, you guys are chemists, so I have to mention a chemical term. Uh, now, we're going to look at a series of quick, 10 quick project ideas that you and your, you or your families might want to pursue. Here's one that doesn't take any science equipment whatsoever. So let me preface it by saying, I don't have a science degree. My degree is in, does anybody know? Many, what's my degree in? Government, that's my wife's name. My degree is in government, 
Texas A&M 1966 with minors in history, English, and military science. I almost flunked freshman chemistry. Okay? I almost flunked it. But you don't need credentials in science to do science. And so phenology is a really superb topic to pursue. Phenology is simply the seasonal changes of plants and, and anything else, but mainly plants and animals, uh, and, it's, and how they uh, are impacted by climate change and, and by uh, uh, heat islands, natural and otherwise. And uh, for example, here's a, uh, a hawthorn tree. And if you keep track of the first day of the year that it buds, or any other tree for that matter, over a period of time, and this is beginning in 1998, you can actually develop a, 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 a time series of first bloom dates, and that can begin to tell you something interesting about the climate. Now, this is a very short time series. It's only 10 years, 11 years. You need 30 years. But you know what? You can begin doing this when your children are really young, and these students don't have family together, but keep that in mind. And by the time your children graduate from high school, you'll have a time series that will actually be valid scientific data. And uh, here's the uh, average for those days, and there's the trend. So we can see that the uh, the, uh, there is an actual trend to the first blooming date. It's not very significant, so we won't even talk about it. But over 230 years, there might be a more significant trend. And here's blue bonnets. The problem with a blue bonnet trend is drought. So this year, we only had, when I made this slide a little while ago, we had no blue bonnets. We actually had three, three blue bonnets on 10 acres. So uh, the drought didn't kill them all, but it almost did. So we can then superimpose the blue bonnets and the hawthorns and see that there's a similarity in the first bloom day, which I found remarkable because the hawthorn is a tree and the blue bonnet's not. So there's uh, project one. Project two, the heat island effect. Uh, our, daughter, uh, our youngest daughter, Sarah, did an exhaustive process study of the heat island effect using a data logger with a minister mounted on our farm. We drove all the way across Texas to Mexico and back. And she found that everything that human beings had touched was slightly warmer than nature. For example, a gravel road in the middle of West Texas is slightly warmer than the, the road nearby, the, the, I'm sorry, the terrain nearby. You can use one of these temperature guns or infrared temperature receivers. And for example, that's 83 degrees Fahrenheit, that concrete up there. And down here on the floor, it's 81 because the hot air rises and we've got lots of hot air. We're all talking. Each of your bodies is equivalent to at least a 100 watt light bulb. If, if you weigh a little bit more than you should, maybe 110, 120 watt light bulb. But we're all emitting infrared, so that temperature is down here near the, near the floor. And this is a fantastic thing. San Antonio has a really important heat island. Now, the temperature in San Antonio has done what since 1885? What's happened? It's gone down. It's gone down very slightly, a few, a few tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. If we incorporate the global or the heat island effect caused by the buildings, the concrete, and the pavement, the temperature has dropped about 2.5 degrees since 1885. The National Weather Service has the data, and you can get it for yourself. Now, here's an example of heat islands. Here's a highway in West Texas. This is between Junction and Kerrville. And you can see that some of the pavement is new, and it's white. Then you have the old dark pavement. So let's go look at the temperature of this heat island. Uh, we see that the dark pavement, I'm showing this in Fahrenheit, is a bit of Celsius. Students, why am I doing that? Do you have any idea? Any idea? Why would I use Fahrenheit instead of the metric Celsius? Because Fahrenheit has higher resolution. So just because it's in vogue to use the metric system, sometimes the metric system doesn't have the resolution of the old-fashioned system. So I use Fahrenheit for that. When I give a scientific paper, I have to convert it to Celsius. So that's 113 on the dark pavement, but the light pavement is only 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And let's look at nature. The gravel next to the highway is only 87 degrees Fahrenheit, and the plants next to the gravel are only 67 degrees Fahrenheit. So we go from the dark pavement of 113 to the vegetation of 67. See how dramatic a heat island can be? Anything you do has a heat island effect on nature, and on the town where you live, or the house where you live. Here's a summary of the temperatures. This is a great science fair project. My daughter can tell, tell you that. Now, ball cypress tree, that's one of the most popular trees in Texas. It's the largest tree this uh, side of the Mississippi, except for the redwoods and the, uh, the giant trees of California. Uh, here's a common ball cypress, Taxodium distichum. And what is characteristic about that tree? Well, it's pyramidal shaped. It has a moon in the background. It has, uh, it's growing right next to water. It has knees. So that's a typical ball cypress. Now here's a ball cypress on the Guadalupe River. What do you see? Pretty different. Flat top with maybe a little bit of a dome. No knees. It has much thinner rings. 
And here's two side by side. Now, something tells me.